Well, hello, and again, welcome to another session of Biblical News Updates and Commentary. By now, many of you are well aware of the most recent Supreme Court ruling legalizing homosexual unions as legitimate marriages. That's right, across the whole United States, throughout all of the states in the union, homosexual couples now can legitimately get marriage licenses and enter into a relationship that is legitimately considered marriage. Now, many of you are upset over this. A lot are very disturbed over the perception they have of this forced legislation upon the people of the United States. And rightly so. I mean, make no mistake over this issue. It was forced upon the people of the United States. And if I might add, not by the legislative branch, but rather by the judicial branch of the United States government. And it only goes to illustrate the continuing decline, the continuing decline of the American government and its disrespect for its own structure as predicated and defined by its own constitution. But, you know, regardless of this particular ruling on marriage by the Supreme Court, the fact of it is I think all of us would admit that we're living in a day and age when things really don't appear to be what they really are. I recently cite Bruce Jenner here, a guy that many of us grew up with, with his face on the box of Wheaties, gifted in multiple sports, and was given multiple gold medals in the Olympics, a specimen of the male gender that was really very, very supreme and superior in many, many areas, and yet today wants us to believe his name, Bruce Jenner, has now been changed and more properly describing him as Caitlyn Jenner, of all things. Ms. Ms. Dozal, who was formerly the president of the Spokane chapter of the NAACP, adamantly claiming that she is an African American. However, upon interviewing her parents, who by the way were Caucasian, definitively insist she's not an African American, but rather she is Caucasian by her own genes and DNA, and her parents, of course, both of them being Caucasian. But th this is nothing strange, or at least it shouldn't be considered strange by any of us. I mean, many criminals in our penitentiaries today all claim they're innocent, that they're not guilty for the crimes that they were prosecuted on and as a result incarcerated for. Some, uh, those who are involved in investments and scams, swindling people out of money, the Bernie Madoffs of the world, or even mates who are cheating on their mates and claiming they don't have an affair when in fact they are having an affair, are all involved in so many of these ruses that we are surrounded by on a daily basis, whether being scammed on the telephone or scammed in the newspaper or scammed with our own financial planners, there are all kinds of things, my friends, that appear to be what they are when in fact they're nowhere near what they are at all. And so it is with marriage. So it is with marriage. To use this term for describing homosexual unions, I submit to you, is not marriage at all. Let me explain what I'm talking about. Over here in the book of Romans and in chapter 3, the Apostle Paul in the narrative in chapters 2 leading up to chapter 3, and I'll get there in a moment, claims that the Jews, who were having a bit of a self-righteous problem there in the city of Rome with the Gentiles, thinking that they were more special than the Gentiles, chapter 2, Paul attempts to level the playing field, claiming that there is no respecter of persons with God, and consequently the Jews need to get themselves in line recognizing the fact that they really are not special in the eyes of God. Well, this causes the Jews to ask Paul, that is the Jews in that congregation there in Rome, well then what advantage does the Jew have? And Paul rightly states the fact that, well, you were delegated, you were given the responsibility to keep the oracles of God. You can read this narrative and scenario here in chapters 3, verses 1 through about 3, where this is all described. And the apostle says you were delegated the fact that you were to keep and, and to record, preserve, and protect the writings, that is, the law, the prophets, and to make sure that it was all kept up to date. But Paul plays the devil's advocate with himself, and he presents a question of this fact, that whether or not, what if 
What if one of those guys who were delegated the responsibility of keeping the law, of making sure that the writings and the prophets were accurately preserved and protected, were not a believer? Would that have any impact on the content of God's Word? Of course not. Of course not, my friends. There are certain absolutes in life, are there not? Regardless of whether or not the scribe, the Jewish scribe or the Benjamite scribe, or whoever the scribe was who was recording the law, the prophets, and the writings believed or not, had no bearing on God's truth. What is truth is truth. And these absolutes are immovable. They, they, they don't move. They are anchored in the solidity of truth and consequently reflect the absolutes of God, just like in the material world. I mean, we have gravity, do we not? We have light. Light is limited at a certain speed. What is it, 186,000 miles a second? And there are certain absolutes in equating the mineral content of whether or not it might be calcium or, or magnesium, or how about gold and silver? There are certain molecular weights and structures associated with minerals and chemicals. There are certainly laws associated with uh, as I say, oxygen and H2O, water of all things. I mean, there are certain absolutes that we have to deal with in life that are not movable. They are just stationary, and that's just the way it is. Well, what I want to submit to all of you is that there are also spiritual absolutes. That's right. There are spiritual absolutes. Marriage is one of those spiritual absolutes. And so regardless of how you may want to define marriage, marriage has a particular definition. And the definition of marriage is surrounded by a definition that is embedded in this particular word. Because you see, marriage is a sacred institution, my friends. It derives its authority and its identity from the very Word of God. Consequently, unless the profile matches what the Word of God describes as marriage, then it is, whatever that relationship may be, not marriage. Because you see, again, let me remind you, and I'm going to repeat this throughout the course of this presentation to where perhaps it becomes ad nausea, but the fact of it is marriage is a sacred institution, and it is established on the very words of God's definition of marriage. Like it or not, that is immovable, and that in itself establishes the definition of marriage. Let me show you a little bit of what I'm talking about over here in the book of Genesis and in chapter 1. In the book of Genesis and in chapter 1, we begin to see the definition of marriage being brought to light by the writer here who happened to be Moses at the time. And here in this particular case, verse 27, we read, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female, created he them. And God blessed them, the male and the female. And God said unto them, Be fruitful, multiply, replenish, reproduce yourself, replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl, and so forth and so on. Furthermore, over here in chapter 2, and in verse 21, we break into the context as this particular chapter draws to a close, and we read, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs, closed it up his flesh instead thereof, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made him a woman, a man with a womb, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones. The woman is bone of my bones, Adam says, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called, in the Hebrew, it's Isha. She shall be called woman, Isha, because she was taken out of Ish. 
And so this relationship and identification of male and female, heterosexual in its relationship to each gender, becomes clearer and clearer right from the get-go, right in chapters 1 and 2 we, we see here. And the conclusion of the matter in chapter 2, verse 24, notice, is this, Therefore, the writer states, as he rounds third and heads home, shall a man leave his father and mother, shall cleave, he shall embrace, he shall connect up to, and I don't need, I don't believe, to remind you of your imagination and perhaps how that all kind of works, but I, I'm sure you get my drift when we use the word here, cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Furthermore, over here in the New Testament, the very words of Jesus, the very words of Jesus in the book here of the Gospel of Mark and in chapter 10, we read here as Jesus is addressing some issues with his uh, most favorite people, the Pharisees uh, and some of the scribes, mentions is he kicks back a little bit on a discussion with regard to divorce, but in the course of the discussion he states this. Notice, he says here in verse 6 we break into the context, but from the beginning, now we just read the beginning in the book of Genesis, that's what Jesus is referencing to. Remember the only scriptures of the new early testament church there was the Old Testament scriptures, so Jesus is reaching back into the book of Genesis. He says here in verse 6, but from the beginning of the creation God made them both male and female. Jesus is corroborating and working with and validating the very words of God from the Old Testament to illustrate the clarity of the relationship that defines what marriage, which is a spiritual institution and therefore cannot be moved right or left, up or down. It is an absolute like gravity like water, two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. That's just the way it is. Marriage is defined according to the Word of God. And so Jesus goes on, For this cause shall a man leave his mother and his father cleave. There's that uh, word again, a reference to his wife. The two shall be one flesh, so then they are no more two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. So you see, my friends, this institution called marriage, and marriage is an institution, and that's what a lot of people forget. And because it's a sacred institution, it's not a civil institution. It is a sacred institution, and it derives its authority and its identity from the very Word of God. And why is it sacred? Why is it an institution reserved unto God and stands alone above all relationships? And why is it by itself a considered holy institution? Because it reflects the very relationship of Jesus Christ with His church and how He is reproducing many sons and daughters into, of all things, what many people don't understand, the family of God. Over here in the book of Ephesians and in chapter 5, this imagery is illustrated very clearly. I'm not making it up. I mean, this is the very Word of God. And sadly, because of the lack of understanding of this very Word, so much confusion has erupted and emerged into the public square. And it's a shame to many of the pastors throughout the North American continent for not making this information known so that the confusion that we now find ourselves wallowing in, engulfed in, drowning in, wouldn't have perhaps had the effect and the impact it had. But that's neither here nor there now. It is what it is. But here in Ephesians 5, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Maybe you can take the time to break into the context, commencing in verse 22, and read to the end of the chapter, verses 33. I will pick up, though, toward the end here because I want to illustrate. After Paul goes through this narrative of 
describing marriage and the relationship of a man and woman and the logistics, the metrics of how it works and how the relationship works and plays off of each other, he comes down here to verse 31 or verse 32 and he says this, this is a great mystery. What's a great mystery? Marriage? No, 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 no. Paul's going to tell you here in this very moment. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. That's right, my friends. This whole narrative from starting with verse 22 to the end of this chapter is not really all about marriage. It's about the metaphor of the relationship of God and His relationship to the church and how marriage is the metaphor of that reality, that spiritual reality. That's what I'm driving at here. And therein lies a very important distinction to make with regard to the sacredness and the holiness of the term marriage. So regardless of of the homosexual community attempting to adopt the term marriage. They can yell all day long. They can go to the housetops and scream at the top of their lungs that they are married. But the fact of it is they are not because they don't meet the criteria. They don't meet the lipness test. It isn't the profile by which marriage, which is defined as a sacred institution, is. The Supreme Court, it can pass all kinds of laws and claim it's marriage. But the fact of it is, as they say at the end of the day, if it doesn't walk like a duck and smell like a duck and quack like a duck, it's not a duck. And it may, or they, that is the homosexual community, may want you to think they have marriage rights now and the relationship that they're entering into, these couples, these same-sex unions, are indeed enjoying the, the blessings of this sacred institution in the same regard as the meeting or, ones, or couples that do meet this profile. They're sadly, my friends, sadly mistaken in so many ways. So no matter how you slice it, <laughs> No matter how you dice it, what homosexuals have today are civil unions. They have civil partnerships. They have legal rights to pass their estates uh, with similar tax impacts as heterosexuals within the government of the United States as it stands today. But that's what they are. They're not marriages. And no matter how much you want to claim that they are marriages, if it doesn't meet the description, if it doesn't meet the criteria, if it doesn't meet the litmus test, if it doesn't have the ingredients of what this book, the Holy Scriptures define as marriage, then it's not marriage. Because again, marriage doesn't derive its authority or identity from the laws of man. Marriage derives its authority, its identity, and its institutionalization from the very word of God, and that makes it a sacred and holy institution. But, nevertheless, in a free and progressive society, we have individuals and people who do indeed want to claim certain things being a certain way, and they want the right and the freedom to go ahead, the argument goes, to love who they want to love. And, frankly, in a neo-heathen culture, you have to expect these kinds of things. You have to expect these kinds of things. They happen. You can't stop it because they make the rules. You see, they are the ones that decide on how everyone else is going to see it. They lay down the terms. It's about what they want. And if you disagree and don't get on the bandwagon with them, well, then you're just wrong. You're out of order. And in this particular case, some have even been called bad names like bigots and closed-minded and prejudicial and all those kinds of things. But the fact of it is, they set their will to define things that they believe are to be right. And consequently, this supersedes, supersedes everything and everybody else's opinion. And again, I submit to all of us, this shouldn't be a surprise. 
I want to read something to you over here in 2 Timothy chapter 3. The Apostle Paul writes a prophecy regarding the latter days. Notice what he says here in chapter 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days, Paul is talking about the last days, perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, continent, fierce, despisers of those things that are good. Does this sound a little familiar? Notice this. Verse 4, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness. Notice this. This is a very sage statement that Paul wrote down here. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Paul's advice? From such. Turn away. So, we shouldn't be surprised at these things. Mankind, for millennia, has been assuming the role of defining what is right and what is wrong, and consequently has literally laid a legacy of suffering, pain, and destruction in the wake of his decisions. My suggestion and my advice is that all of us probably should start preparing for additional terms that will most likely be legitimized, normalized, and sadly, perhaps even legalized. Euthanasia, polygamy, polyandry, bestiality. These are terms in the wings that are waiting to come into the batter's box for consideration within the United States, within Canada, Europe, and in some cases, I'm sorry to say, some of these terms already are well on their way to being legalized, if not already legitimized, and in some cases normalized, and actually has given birth to businesses and actually generating a segment of business. Sadly, this all is part and parcel to what happens to a very secular and humanistic society and culture that begins to push God out in its trending and in its continued pursuit to become a neo-heathen society. So, no matter what the homosexual community may call their same-sex unions, whether they call it marriage and want to claim it's marriage, they, even from the Supreme Court's position, calls it marriage. The fact of it is, according to the Bible and the definition of that particular uh, statement and profile of what the Bible describes as a marriage, because again, let me remind all of us, marriage is a holy institution. It is sacred. It does not derive its authority or identity from the laws of man, but it does only from the laws of God. And so therefore, real marriage is defined by this book. And if real marriage is not defined by this, then what you have is not marriage. And I dare say, and I submit to all of us, that frankly, the homosexual community, what they have is not marriage. What they have is civil unions, civil partnerships. So, be encouraged. God is still on His throne. His salvific plan is secured. And marriage still represents the relationship of God and His church, Jesus Christ specifically, and how God is reproducing Himself through the impregnation of His Holy Spirit to bring sons and daughters into His family. Oh, that's right, my friends. Marriage is a heterosexual arrangement that has the potential of reproduction because that was the intent and the purpose of God because God is reproducing Himself. He created a species made after His own image so that He, that is, mankind, could also, like God, reproduce himself. I don't need to go into a lot of details, I don't believe. I think common sense will tell you that the litmus test, the profile, the criteria of really defining what marriage is, is certainly very clear. 
extremely clear and doesn't really need a whole lot of debate. No, my friends, if we're honest, if we're honest with the surroundings that we're in, Bruce Jenner is a man. Miss Dozal, Dozal is a Caucasian. Homosexuals have civil unions, civil partnerships, and what those who are pursuing relationships defined by God's holy word are in fact actual considered legitimate marriages. My friends, let us help you to better understand this particular topic. Why don't you go ahead now, hit us on our website at www.cgi.org. Ask for this free offer, and let me again emphasize, this is free. It's a one-hour presentation, a CD titled, The Sacred Meaning of Marriage. It's free. All you've got to do is hit us on that website or email us and request it by email at info at cgi.org, and we'll send it out to you. Give us a couple of weeks or so to get it out, but I'm sure you'll enjoy it. It will help you to clarify what we're talking about here in that there is a distinctive distinction of this term marriage that everybody is overlooking and not really paying attention to. So don't get shook. Don't be worried. Marriage is still marriage because marriage is protected by the spiritual absolutes as defined by God's Word. And that's why you need to get this CD. It'll help to straighten all that out and add some clarity to the issue. My friends, this is Bill Watson reminding all of you and hoping again to see you right back here in another session. A bit Biblical news updates and commentary.